I guess we can get started now. Um, well, thank you everybody for coming to this panel. This is the first ever MMA panel at the Sports Analytics Conference. Uh, my name is Andy, Andy Chu. Um, I'm a second year MBA student at MIT Sloan. And today, for th those of you guys who've really followed the sport, you'll see some of the, who's the, the, the top names, I guess, um, amongst the analysts online and what have you. So from left to right, we have uh, Luke Thomas from MMA Fighting. Um, next to Luke is uh, um, Rami uh, Gower from Fight Metric. Um, we also have Dominic Cruz, the current UFC Bantamweight champion. And we have Jordan Breen next to him. And our moderator, moderator will be John Wertheim from Sports Illustrated. Um, so if you have any questions, just tweet to um, tweet the questions, uh, insert your questions, hashtag SSAC13, hashtag 205 for the room we're in right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to filter the questions and then hopefully answer some of those at the end of the, um, the panel discussion. So um, I guess I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Students have done a great job organizing this. You were probably waiting for our walk-in music. It, it never came. But it's really an honor to be here. Special props to uh, Dom here took this fight on short notice and uh, <laughs> showed up ready to go. So we appreciate that. And I've been covering MMA. I went to my first fight in 2007 and immediately became hooked. And even two years, three years after that, I was still, I'd do radio interviews, I'd get questions, is it, is it real? Did people die in the ring? My favorite was always, are there props? As if, uh, you know, you're, you're going in there with a metal folding chair. Um, here we are, 2013, the sport's as big as ever, and I think it really speaks to the growth and the rapid rise of MMA and the UFC, that we're, we're having a non-ironic panel here about analytics in, in mixed martial arts and the UFC. So thanks, everyone, for coming. I figure we may as well, we'll UFC style, we'll get right to it, and we'll, we'll go broad with the first question. You know, we have two talented, versatile journalists. We have Rami, who has literally stake in the game, and then we've got the only guy here with cauliflower here. We've got an actual fighter. So why don't we just go, go down the line here, and where are we with, with analytics in, in MMA right now? Well, Rami is more capable of answering this question probably than anyone on the panel, but as a journalist, I would say we're in nascent stages um, for a variety of reasons. One, the, the, the research and the development of what we know about statistics has not been happening for very long, which isn't to say that he hasn't worked hard and made uh, huge progress, but you know, relatively speaking, you know, baseball's been at it for a long time, basketball's been at it for a long time, football, and so forth. So it hasn't happened that much. From a monetization standpoint, there aren't a lot of people investing in trying to figure out what's happening. There's some of that, but you know, relative to other sports, um, that's, that is still coming along. I think we're at a point now where we're looking at statistics and we're saying this is after the fact, helping us understand uh, how fights um, looked. Um, I think really it, it's helping us understand the, the careers of more established fighters. One of the things that Fightmetric does so well is when a fighter retires, they give you an excellent sense of why they were good. What was the particular way in which this fighter was good? Um, but there are some challenges that remain. Predictive modeling, I think, is a, is a far way off. Rami can speak to some of the other challenges. But it is an important part. It helps understand fights. Um, it helps, in some ways, understand fighters. We are still, however, I think, not quite over the hurdle of, um, of statistics telling us something particularly new and novel in a way that changes our pers perspective of the game. I'd like to think that we're at a tipping point. Uh, Fightmetric as a company is only five, five and a half years old. And we've gotten to the point right now where supply is still greater than demand. We still have many, many more numbers that we could do excellent things with, but there just isn't enough demand for us to do stuff with it. Uh, as Luke mentioned, you know, the, the monetization is not there. That's certainly true. But even amongst the fan base, we're getting more people who are interested in it. And as we can show people what the numbers can do, uh, we start very small. We start with things like the equivalent of batting average in baseball. The first number that people will look at is striking accuracy. Uh, or takedown accuracy, takedown defense. These are very, very basic numbers. Now, it's true that they didn't exist before, and what we do with them is critical. And we've gotten to the point right now where I feel like there's, there's almost something happening, because people are starting to look at ways to accentuate their broadcast. The UFC has started to include more numbers in their telecast, in the, the shows on fuel and so forth that Dominic is, uh, is participating in. So if we can just push this a little bit further, we can get this a little further into the mainstream, make it part of the, the lingua franca of the sport so that when people talk about MMA, they start to, to use numbers much like they do in football or basketball or baseball. Um, that's where we are right now. 
I see the, the sport growing with the fight metrics growing. It's kind of, it's all happening at the same, same time, if you ask me. And I think that uh, the next stage for fight metrics and numbers to be, to play a bigger part in MMA has to do with people really retiring. It sounds kind of weird maybe, but you kind of need that, that, re that, that group of guys to retire and jump back into the sport and give back to the sport in order to get realistic numbers because I feel that the next step in the numbers is knowing what a takedown is compared to what a takedown isn't. Um, in order to keep track of that, you have to know what a takedown is. And I think that when more people in the sport retire, there's gonna be more knowledge in the numbers um, and it will improve everything. And right now, fight metrics and everything that's going on is huge for the fans. And I think it helps a lot with media to give um, something to bite on. And I think that it's a huge tool and it will definitely make uh, watching MMA a lot more interesting to the, to the fan that doesn't necessarily understand the sport. Now you can look at a number and say, well, that number says what I was curious about, uh, rather than having to understand the sport. It kind of like will help build everything at once, uh, including, you know, once these people retire, the, uh, the, the, the people that are in the sport now retire and move on. I think a lot of what Rami brought up is, is important, and also what Dominic mentioned, the idea of people getting a picture of what the sport should actually look like. A lot of people, I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about MMA is that it's a sport that serves to both excite people and alienate people. A lot of people see their first MMA fight and are instantly hooked and instantly thrilled, and a lot of people see an MMA fight and it seems uh, strange or esoteric to them, they can't really get into it. So having those kind of metrics that can accurately relay what's happening in a fight and why it's happening and why it's important are, are critical. And, not to necessarily blow smoke with Rami, but fight metric I think has been incredibly important at this point in time and um, because of that idea of, of really showing people maybe what's happening in a fight, I mean the fact of the matter is, I mean if you've ever seen this guy fight, a lot of action can happen in a very, very short window of time and so a lot of people, you know, did that really land? Who's really winning in these kinds of things? And obviously judging has been an issue in MMA for as long as people have fought mixed martial arts and so when I think one of the really big values in fight metrics so far has been because it's allowed people to get a look at statistics that get to the heart of what's really happening in a fight and maybe who is actually winning, it's forced accountability for judging, which is something that didn't really exist before. I mean, for years in MMA, people had a feeling that maybe the judges weren't the greatest and that maybe some of the people presiding over the sport um, shouldn't have been. And resultantly, I think Fightmetric has created something where people are able to get a much more realistic picture of a fight and force a kind of accountability. I think uh, people have already so quickly picked up on proprietary fight metric statistics. You know, I, mean, I get emails and talk to people who say things like significant strikes without even thinking about it now. And significant strikes wasn't a thing a few years ago. It's something that they came up with. So the more these things gain a foothold and the more they gain a kind, kind of common parlance, people all end up speaking the same language and people kind of get on board in a way that maybe people hadn't in the past. Because traditionally, you know, there's been a lot of apples and oranges kind of opposition in MMA. If one guy dominates his foe on the ground for two minutes and 30 seconds and the other guy houses him on the feet for two minutes and 30 seconds, how are we really supposed to perceive this? And so statistically, I think we've moved in a direction where we have a much more realistic depiction of that. And it's those, those who maybe can't wrap their head around it or can't kind of get on board are kind of shown for maybe not being the most attentive, not being the most thoughtful to actually what's playing out in the fight. So when I've, when I've spoken to fighters about this, I said, you know, wouldn't it help you to know that after the second round, the opponent you're about to face has never snapped off any kicks? I've gotten the sense that it's almost, uh, you know, it's a paralysis by analysis. They almost don't want to clutter their, their minds when they get in there. I'm curious from a fighter standpoint, I mean, you, the UFC, you know, Joe Silva tells you who your next opponent's going to be. You've got X months or X weeks to prepare. To what extent are you looking at, at advanced statistics and analytics? Um, <clears throat> You know, I get this question, I've gotten this question more in the last two days than ever in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and Which way that cuts. It comes down to, numbers do play a small part, but I'll also say that I think the sport is still evolving, so I keep saying that because of how true it is. Uh, the people who are thinking and using statistics as fighters, in my opinion, are thinking ahead of the game. So. <clears throat> I don't think that that's happening a lot with a lot of fighters. I think they could use it, but possibly don't. And, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I'm fighting the stuffiness out here. Uh, at the same time as that, you've got 
you look at the numbers, and let's say this guy, uh, after the second, second round, he doesn't throw any kicks, like he said. So you got to look at styles make fights in fighting more than numbers make fights. And what I mean by that is you got, uh, let's say, Demetrius Johnson, who never gets tired, and he never, never slows down. He'll look the same from round one to round five. And then you've got other guys who slow their pace. Well, depending on who Demetrius is fighting, he's going to have tougher problems grappling people or striking with people. For instance, he usually outstrikes everybody. Well, when he fought me, I made him wrestle with me for five rounds. So now his striking numbers weren't the same. That was, <clears throat> no matter how many numbers I looked at all his past fights, I got to look and say, I'm going to make it a different fight with him. And as a fighter, your goal is to put the, your opponent against their best numbers. So if their best numbers are showing in every aspect of the, of the fight, you've got to figure out how to beat them at every aspect of the fight and put them against their numbers. If they've got a great right hand and that's what they land more than everything, then you need to make sure you're circling the right way, throwing the left high a lot so that they're trying to block instead of throwing the right hand, and now I've taken away their right hand and they didn't throw it once on me. So styles make fights, and if a person is smart enough to read that stuff, then they'll start making people fight their style instead of adjusting to their numbers. Or, yeah, you wanna, I was going to say that I uh, it wasn't a mixed martial arts fighter, but I spoke to Seth Mitchell. Seth Mitchell's a heavyweight boxer out of D.C., well, Brandywine, Maryland, but D.C., they claim him anyway. He was a uh, Michigan State Spartan, a uh, All-American linebacker, and uh, he transitioned later in life to boxing, so there's lots, you know, lots of questions about his ability to transition, but the long and short of it is he was an obsessive tape watcher and numbers guy whenever he played anybody in football. He would tell me he would, I mean, he would spend hours and hours looking at tape and looking at numbers and when they, when the tight end lines up here, what formations are they going to run and what plays are they going to run, he would know everything. And now when he gets to boxing, he barely watches anything. There's almost a superstition that if I pay attention to the numbers and if I pay attention to the styles in such detail, I begin to lose the force for the trees. I'll be looking for the, the left uppercut when he dips his shoulder and then they do something completely different. Now whether or not that's the case, I don't know. Fighting involves, in fact, I think a fair amount of superstition, fairly or unfairly. But you do sort of encounter fighters saying, I, I let my manager watch tape, I let my manager look at the numbers, you just tell me what to train today, coach. You, you encounter that, I think, a lot. I think part of the issue is fighters being proactive about looking at the numbers and understanding them and finding out what they say because you know, incontestably, they're informative. It's just whether or not they want to make the approach to them. Well, you, I mean, you guys are sort of, I think you're, we're all dancing around. We're all, we're all data guys. We're all sort of on the same team here. We all see virtue, but I'll, I'll play devil's advocate and we'll kind of try to pick apart maybe some of the, the imperfections and inefficiencies. I mean, one of them is, we've sort of hinted at this, is just sample size. I mean, fights can last less than a minute. You know, an NBA player can play 200 minutes in a week. Vitor Belfort, well, you name your fighter, they can, they can fight seven minutes in the course of a year and may not throw a single kick. I mean, how, how do you, Rami, how do you get around with, I mean, there are 400, hundreds of fighters under contract, but for a specific fighter, it seems to be a pretty limited data set. It's, it's the biggest challenge we have. The biggest challenge we have is small sample size because, like you say, a guy might fight for a couple minutes and that's his entire year. It's like, imagine if a, a player's entire baseball season was instead of 162 games, they played like four times. But that was a complete season. And they were considered to be as successful as everyone else because there's really only, there's only one success metric in, in mixed martial arts. It's wins. That's it. It's not like in a team sport where there are different ways that you can contribute, but there's confounding team factors. At the end of the day, in a mixed martial arts fight, a fighter is going to win or he's going to lose, and that's it. So we have to take a look at some creative ways to get around small sample size. We can do that by a greater use of comparables. We can take a look at weight class effects. We can look at different things about these guys, which tries to tell us not necessarily what they've done in the past, but what have other people who are similar to them done in the past, what are they likely to do in the future. Uh, and then our best metrics are the ones that are saved for the people for whom we have the most data. And t luckily for us, those are also the people who people, uh, the fans care the most about. The people who are the most popular are the guys who have fought for a very long time. We have a ton of data on George St. Pierre. We have a ton of data on Anderson Silva. And it's an 80-20 thing. 80% of the questions that we get asked are about maybe not even 20% of the fighters. So small sample size is definitely a big issue and it's something that unfortunately we'll never be able to cure because we can't get these guys to fight 162 times a year. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, maybe you could. But the, uh, you know, we, we do our, our best to try to get around that by looking at macro effects for the sport rather than the micro effects between you know, this round and that round. I mean, one of the other problems too when we're talking about sample size is the fact, I mean, 
USC has over 400 people on roster right now. And the fact of the matter is, if you split that over eight divisions, I suppose nine if you include the women's bantamweight division now as well, the fact of the matter is lots of people are doing different things. If you talk to people within the USC, matchmakers, promoters, they're going to tell you it takes all kinds. You know, it doesn't just take Anderson Silva and George St. Pierre. It takes guys who go out and brawl like Leonard Garcia as well. And because of that, you end up with, I think, some distorted pictures. I mean, famously, one of the stats that people drew ire with was um, there was a UFC event where Mike Goldberg proudly proclaimed that Matt Brown was the second most accurate <laughs> welterweight striker in UFC history, which sounds laughable because Matt Brown, while an incredibly thrilling and exciting fighter, is basically a straightforward brawler who you certainly wouldn't associate with being precise and accurate. But the fact is, because he has that role, he's often in fights where he's brawling with other people, he's facing like-minded fighters, he's getting into straight fisticuffs, so he's probably facing guys who are greater defensive liabilities, guys that he can hit, and guys that are going to engage him and allow him to counter, creating a picture where you know he's landing an awful ton of shots. So when you have those kind of situations, conversely, I mean, if you're if you're someone who you know maybe doesn't get in the greatest graces of the UFC, someone like John Fitch before he was cut, you're being placed against opposition that's tough but not, you know, not guys that, you know, you're going to get seen on television or whatever, but you're still facing very, very sterling top opposition. And so statistically, you might not be able to do all that you want to do in a particular fight. So based on the fact that there's so many different kinds of fighters, even within the UFC, I mean, there's lots of fighters at 135 that will never have a shot at facing Dominic for his title and probably even realize it. Doesn't mean they don't have a place in the UFC, but statistically, it makes them kind of hard and difficult to deal with when certain fighters are always pegged for action fights or when some guys are called upon to be a particular kind of gatekeeper because there's so many different functions of a particular fighter on the UFC roster. Not all of these guys are doing the same thing. When someone you know, goes to the free throw line in basketball or when just when someone steps on the court, in general, they're trying to put the ball in the hoop or stop someone from doing it. Or when someone steps up to the plate, they're pretty much trying to advance base runners or hit a home run or whatever the case might be. Objectives are generally the same, whereas the actual concept of why a guy's fight's made versus another person and, and ultimately impacting his own sample is drastically different from fight to fight to fight. Really, the most consistent kind of metrics we can get, and probably one of the reasons the 80-20 thing is good, is that guys like Dominic and guys like Anderson Silva and guys like George St. Pierre, they're facing the most similar opposition time in time out because they're facing the elite fighters that have earned their way to title shots. So their data is probably more representative of what they can actually do than fi as fighters than someone who's constantly being paired up with someone who's stylistically preferable or a matchup that's designed to create fireworks on television. One thing I can say is that every, every fight is critical from a data perspective because of the small sample size. So you take a look at a guy who might be one and done in the UFC and will never remember that fight for the most part because it happened on the undercard and then he's gone. But he serves an absolutely critical function because we need to get every kind of fight in the system to understand the sport generally. Yes, you can take a look at each fighter and their individual proclivities or whatever. But the point is, is that every fight gives us a sense for what the sport as a whole is. And getting back to your initial question of where are we, we're still really in the data collection phase. Uh, when baseball analytics started, when Bill James gets started, he has 100 years of statistics that you can go back and take a look at. But MMA, or UFC at least, is coming on 20 years old. Uh, there's just not that much. And so every single fight that happens, despite the fact that it might not be among guys who will ever fight again, contend for championships, you may not remember their name, you may not have seen the fight, but it all comes into this larger data model uh, we needed to build that up initially to be able to say anything about the sport. Thankfully, we're there. But the more data that we get and the better data we get on all of these fights, it just makes it that much more robust, and we can do so much more with it. When, when did you start? I'm guessing you were not starting your data collection when there was one way class. I mean, you wait for unified rules, or when, when did you start your, your The data? data collection? Yeah, yeah. Data collection started in US. 2007 <coughs> with 2007, but it quickly went backward. Fight metric, just as a little bit of history, started as a curiosity. Uh, it was intended to satisfy a couple of interesting questions, the questions mainly of who should have won that decision. Uh, and so that meant that the initial data collection was centered around controversial decisions. We went back and did fight by fight on an opportunistic basis saying, you know, the first one we're going to do was BJ Penn versus George St. Pierre, the first one. And then the next one we went back and we'll take a look at, you know, Rico Rodriguez versus Noguera and Pride because these are the ones that are the most intensely controversial in terms of who should have won the decision. But uh, at some point, you just have to go back and start filling in the gaps. And you go back through history. We went back all the way to UFC 1, despite the fact that Maybe. those fights are not really apples to apples because the rules are completely right. different. But uh, you, you, know, you, you do eventually have to fill in all the gaps, also because we want to answer those questions. What is the difference between a fight that has a different set of rules? If we take a look at a Japanese rule set where they may allow knees to the head on the ground, 
what does that do to the remainder of the fight? How does that affect the ground action? Does it change the validity or the, the value of, let's say, side control? Side control, uh, if you can knee a guy to the head on the ground from side control, you can do a lot more things with it. If you take away elbows, what does that do to, let's say, the mount position? So looking at all the different styles of mixed martial arts, the different organizations, the different rule sets, the different time sets, does 10 minute first round matter? We take a look at every piece of data that we can get our hands on and it helps us answer the greatest range of questions. Also, one thing that I think we should uh, focus on, there's this intense need, I think, and, or, or uh, gravitational pull to look at fighters as the individual unit of measurement. Like, let's, let's, let's sort of like put statistics and refract them through how, this individual fighter's career. To me, though, if you ask yourself, in the, just, just in the UFC, not including all the other organizations, just UFC, I think I read from someone who compiled the data, there were 5,000 takedowns just in the UFC last year. 5,000. That, to me, is a workable sample size, I mean, depending on what you want to use. To me, there's larger questions you can answer. Which takedowns are most effective? Double legs, high crotches, single leg sweeps? What, what, what works? Um, now, you want to be careful, like as a football outsider sort of point out, three yard gain on a, on, a, on a rush. Is it three yards to get into the end zone or did you fail to get first down on, on third down conversion, right? So you have to sort of be careful there. What does it mean? A lot of guys do takedowns like Cain Velasquez did against Junior Dos Santos just as a means of being able to open up to punch him. So there are some challenges there, but I do mean if we could look larger at the game, what works? What works in MMA? And, and you have really like excellent wrestlers in mixed martial arts, Dominic Cruz being one of them. Um, what can we learn from fighters in 20, 2012 about wrestling and what it says about the state of the game? I think one of the things that's interesting too and appropriate with wrestling and Dominic, I think one of the limitations now, and Rami and I have discussed in this past, is right now we have a whole lot of numbers, but the fact of the matter is guys in MMA move. I mean, it's not, it's not like this 2D plane where two guys just stand in front of each other and hit one another. And so because we don't really have motion tracking right now, we don't really have a sense of how all these strikes and takedowns and th those kinds of things interact. So, you know, when we get to a point where we can figure out, you know, what's effective, well, anecdotally, we can look at certain fighters and recognize tendencies. You know, it's not a secret that Keith Jardine's been knocked out by a bazillion left hooks or that Michael <laughs> Bisping repeatedly circles to his left even though he's been hit with massive rights time and time again. These are tendencies that we've, we see visually and because these are some prominent fighters who've maybe lost in this way in prominent fashion, we kind of remember them. But so obviously there's going to be more subtle things that fighters do independently that people really don't take notice of. I mean, Mirko Krokops were known for being able to head kick people, yet no one really ever seemed to hone in on the fact that he always circled to his left left for his entire career to get the angle on this, or excuse me, to his right, to get the angle on the head, left head kick that he wanted. You know, these are kinds of things that in MMA, people rely on platitudes like, well, I'm going to bring the fight to him, I'm going to impose my will, <laughs> these kinds of outmoded sort of ideas, and the fact of the matter is that everybody's going to have things that they prefer to do and these sorts of things, but until we can actually track someone's movement and see how they set them up and those sorts of things, it's incredibly difficult, I think, to actually have the real world application that some people hope for. Because I think with statistics, it's nice to be able to force accountability on judges or have the kind of data pornography of, wow, 5,000 takedowns in a year, awesome. But until we can sort of... They're porn merchants. Yeah, until we, can, until we can sort of chart how guys are moving and, and how that is interacting with the strikes they're throwing, when they're throwing them, how many they're landing, and that kind of thing, it's really, really difficult to have any kind of predictive model or any kind of sense of strategically this is how I should approach this fighter. And then you got to kind of think too I feel like who's who's calling the takedowns on the fight metrics? Who's who's taking stats and saying that's a takedown? Yeah. There's 5,000 takedowns. I bet you a thousand of those aren't takedowns. That's my guess. And the reason I say that is because a lot of people haven't stopped doing this sport and then started taking fight metrics or necessarily judging fights or whatever. And what I mean by that is I know wrestlers who can't call a takedown compared to a non-takedown. I repped, I was a referee for wrestling for five years before I even started MMA. And I did that to, to pay my way through my wrestling career. In order to go to nationals, in order to go to regionals, I had to be a referee for wrestling matches in the middle of my competitions. So I'm refing a match and I'm on mat three. You know, so I gotta hurry up, hurry up guys, like finish the match, and then I gotta go to mat three and do my own match. So I know what a takedown is. I know what points are in a wrestling match. It's my belief that truly, I think that's being missed a lot in the fight metrics. And then the judges somewhat get the blame for it. And the reason I say that is because fight metrics, I think are very accurate, and I think they're doing a great job, but I think that sometimes we need maybe somebody to know what a takedown is. Like, I'd like to be able to bring two people out here and say, is this a takedown, is this not? And tell me why. Um, is that a significant strike or wasn't it? How do you know? 
Um, I wonder that as a fighter. Like, man, was that considered a significant strike or not? What is, what is it? What is a takedown, what is it? I mean, that will help us as fighters, and that will help fans too. And I think it would help everybody, judging, fight metrics. I think it all flows together. I think that's an important that's point really too, because point, there's, yeah. there's so much, I mean, people always laugh um, when people say, like, a guy gets a meaningless takedown in the last 10 seconds of round, and you know, you hear someone opine, like, oh, probably stole the round. Really, why? A guy got a takedown, maybe didn't even complete it. Maybe the guy, you know, got to like a crackdown position and just sat there for a second. Right. It's not really a takedown. You didn't really do anything. Well, you, you got it, the guy to his ass, right. but that's it. It depends on the takedown. Exactly. exactly. If he's got a wizard, it's not a takedown. But people are <laughs> counting that a takedown. Exactly. And so I wonder. You know, so well, for the sake of data, too, there's, there's a quality. Apart, apart from the mischaracterization, there's also a quality. I mean, if I have no leverage and I've got mount, but I'm only getting 12 inches of Four punches are much different than four clean punches in, in stand-up. How are you, I mean, apart from significant, how are you really reflecting power and infliction of, of damage? When it comes to things like takedowns, these are a lot easier for us to define. We have, we have a very strict definition of what is and is not a takedown. And you have to be an expert in the sport to be able to understand how to apply that definition. The definition, and uh, you'll forgive me if I didn't get this exactly right, it's a deliberate offensive technique that takes the target off of his feet and puts him on the ground for an appreciable position, amount of time or something like that. But it, it has like six different criteria that have to be met before it can be. It has to be a deliberate technique. It can't be a guy who willingly just flops to his back. That's not a takedown. Uh, it, has to be, it doesn't have to be on his back. It can be off his feet. If you take a guy down to his knees or something like that, that might be a takedown as well. It has to be for an appreciable amount of time. You can't just take him down and he springs right back up again. It has to be in a recognizably advantageous position. You can't take him down except that you end up on the bottom somehow. If you pull guard, for example, it's not a takedown. So there's a number of different ways that we uh, define what is and is not a takedown. We then leave that up to human beings who have to wield that criteria, and we trust that through rigorous training they're able to do this you know, reasonably well, and we do a pretty good job, but uh, you know, significant strikes is the, is the, the bane of my existence, because it's something which is, it's a very, very simple concept, but it's not easily understood, and it's mostly our fault for not having done a good amount of education. What it is is really, it's statistically significant strikes. So it's not a qualitative judgment that we make about this strike or that strike to say that this one was significant and this one wasn't significant. It's a collection of striking categories that collectively have been proven to be statistically significant in ending fights, and it is every strike at distance, no matter what kind of strike at different distance it is, and then when you get in close, so it's either in the clinch or on the ground, it's power strikes. It's not, it's basically every strike other than the little tiny ones that you land in the clinch and on the ground, because those ones don't prove to be statistically significant. Now they're important for us to track, because we want to understand what a total striking picture looks like. But when you take a look and you run the uh, regressions, you're able to see that these ones don't actually affect who wins fights, who stops fights, and so forth. So, uh, significant strikes is a category which you can take a look at and feel confident when you look at the number in knowing that this is something which is going to inform me well about the sport. Uh, we talk a lot about the difference between numbers and data. Numbers is some you know, numerical value that you can put on the screen, but it's not data until you can actually do something with it. You have to be able to draw a conclusion from it. You have to let it inform some decision. And we hope that every number that we put on the screen is also data. And that's what, that's what significant strikes is. It's not just a striking number. It's not a number that says this guy landed 100 and this guy landed 75, because maybe 75 was better than the 100. There's a qualitative difference between them. And so significant strikes is just one stab at doing this with the striking, where we can say that there's a, uh, a significance that the statistics have borne out over time that allow us to say that these ones are better than those ones. And I kind of got to look at what he just said and think, you guys got your hands full with significant <laughs> strikes. And the reason is, uh, tons. Uh, one of the biggest is, again, MMA is new. It's a, it's a newer sport, so you have to judge everything differently. You look at, for instance, um, a good example is Cain Velasquez versus Czech Congo. <clears throat> I think Czech Congo dropped Cain like three times. You couldn't even tell, because on his way down, he's shooting a double. It's like, you're getting rocked, you're getting hit with a super hard punch, but you hide the fact that you're going out on your feet by double-legging somebody and actually getting the takedown. Okay, so what do you count? Do you count that a, a drop? Do you count that a knockdown? Or do you count that a takedown? Or do you count it a significant strike? Or do you count it a takedown? What do you do? You can't tell. The, the, the thing is, that's the fighter taking fight metrics in their own hands and taking away the stat. And they're taking away the fact, he didn't drop me, I took him down. I was, I was on my knee because I was shooting a double leg. I wasn't on my knee because he put me there. 
And how do you judge that? How do you, how do you rate that? It's hard. So it is tough. And it's because all these, all, a fight is all these martial arts mixed together and molded into one. And you have to find the happy medium between, okay, I've got a wizard on this takedown. There's not a takedown, but he's also got my back taken and both hooks in or one hook in. Um, well, in jiu-jitsu, that's two points. In wrestling, that's nothing. So how do you score that? These are the problems that they're running into. These are the problems that, as fighters, we run into and are trying to understand how the judges are going to score it and how the fight metrics guys are going to write it down. You don't know. Um, as a fighter, you kind of, that's why all you hear right now is don't let it go to the judges. That's all you hear fighters saying. It's all you hear Dana saying, you know? And I, you kind of got to understand it, but at the same time, I don't because it, it, you can't look at a, if this is a sport, there has to be judges, there has to be uh, a numbers, there has to be a, a way to decide the winner other than finishing the guy because are you gonna tell football players you're never gonna go to overtime, ever? Are you gonna tell basketball players you're never gonna go to those second, those, those next two quarters? Finish the game, don't, don't leave it in the hands of, of extra, extra quarters. Well, we're in a fight, what's the difference? I mean, a, a game versus a fight, sometimes you gotta go the distance and you gotta be able to judge that. Let me, uh, we, can, we can talk judges in a second. I, I want to set you up, though, a little, UFC style. To, to what extent were you motivated by fight of the night bonus or even knockout of the night uh, earlier in your career versus now? And then I'll, then I'll let you guys as take a As a B. fighter, I think I kind of speak for everybody. You don't necessarily focus on the one. You kind of, I mean, in, in my opinion, it, if you're focusing on a knockout, you're probably going to get knocked out yourself or or. or Tell, tell that that's what you're trying to do. If you're focused on you know, submissions, then you're gonna be chasing submissions, you're not setting them up the same, you're being very aggressive towards them, and it, it's a game plan read of, uh, of for the other fighter. And fight of the night, I mean, what does that take? Be in shape. So it's like, be in shape and all your problems get solved. Right. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm leading you to this, and you didn't bite. But, uh, you know, I think there's always interesting data when we look at performance and look at financial incentive. And I don't, I don't want to talk down to any, I mean, we all know how UFC fighters are paid. They have a contract. More often than not, they get a set amount for a fight. It doubles if you win. But you also have these discretionary bonuses. Knockout of the night, which usually is just visually, everybody knows which one it is. The card that has the, the submission of the night, often it's only one or two. And then you have this fight of the night, which is the, the best, basically the best, the best fight. It, it seems to me if you're... A, a guy that's you know fifteen fifteen thousand dollars a show fifteen to win, but you can double or triple or quadruple that with a fight of the night. You have a much different incentive than some of the high profile fighters where the bonus isn't as much of a motivation. I'm wondering. I, it seemed to me that's an area where maybe the data tells us an interesting story. What makes a fight of the night? Do you have a sense that the fighters with more incentive to to aim for that fight a different way? I mean, I'm curious sort of how that plays out because I think I think these fight of the night bonuses could really be an interesting. Uh, what component of it? Uh, I, Rami gave me some numbers uh, about, what, about a year ago or so. And what we, uh, what we, what he discovered and I sort of wrote about um, was that if you look at the way the card works, there's two parts to a card, a main card and a preliminary card. And you can have very good fighters at, at any point in the card, but an elite fighter like Dominic, who is the champion of his weight class, he will never fight on an undercard. As long as he is champion, he will probably be, in fact, at the top of that card, unless there's another championship fight. Uh, in which case he might be the co-main event. But you get the idea, like the better, sort of bigger status fighter you are, the higher on the card you go, and the greater your exposure, right? Because if you're in the prelim card, you might be fighting for Facebook audiences. If you're the main event, you're fighting in front of the pay-per-view audiences. So what we found though, we, him, what we found <laughs> is, um, you know, well, listen, th these, these bonuses are hugely popular with everybody. The UFC brass like them, fighters like them, fans like them, no one dislikes them. Um, but there's an interesting sort of thing going on because if you're fighting on the main card, you're probably an elite fighter. And if you're an elite fighter, you're probably also fighting another elite fighter, which means if you win, your victory is inherently more valuable or more difficult to achieve. Um, and that leaves the prelim fighters in a bit of a disadvantage. They can put on a sensational performance. They can knock someone's brains uh, completely loose. But if they're fighting people who aren't quite as elite, um, they're starting from a disadvantage. And it turns out what the numbers show is that Submission of the night is more evenly distributed between prelim and main card fighters. And I think the theory is, we don't really know, but the theory is generally that um, you know, um, uh, a submission is a, a thing of beauty. It's uh, unto itself, right? It's, a, it's got a signature and an identity. 
Um, and if you can craft something that looks amazing, you don't have to be the best guy in the world to, to do it. By, by contrast, if you knock out the, the world's fifth best middleweight, that's pretty incredible. That's kind of hard to do. And um, if, you know, if you're in the main event and the number one guy in the world fights the number two guy in the world and that scrap is you know, pretty even, it's going to be hard to give it to two guys who are um, you know, 5-0 and o in, in, in mixed martial arts. Um, so knockout of the night and uh, fight of the night tend to go to main card fighters. Well, if you're a guy, as you mentioned, who's 15 and 15, 15 to show, 15 to win, um, it's going to be harder to get that money that offsets maybe some of your, your pay. By contrast, if you're on the main card, you're already making a lot of money. So again, I'm not here to, to besmirch the, the bonus system. I think it's great. Everyone thinks it's great. But it's just sort of interesting to note that um, it is, there's a, there's a the, the, the playing field isn't necessarily as even, I think the guys on the, on the prelim card have a little more work to do to achieve those, those bonuses. It kind of cuts both ways too, because we have like a recent example that I was bringing up before. There's a UFC card in London recently where the co-feature was an absolutely brilliant 15 minute fight between Cub Swanson and Dustin Poirier. Just a true exhibition of, if you like MMA, this is, this is all phase MMA, striking, grappling, brilliant wrestling, well-conditioned athletes who are thoughtfully, strategically attacking one another in combination. It's what you thirst to see as an MMA fan. And this was passed over for fight of the night in favor of Tom Watson and Stanislav Nedkov, two mid-level middleweights who essentially just bombed on one another with windmills until the other fell apart and kind of had like a seesaw effect. But ultimately, what made that possible was the fact that they simply weren't as skilled. I mean, if that was a comparable, if, you know, if Dustin Poirier or Cub Swanson were comparably skilled, they probably would have just gone hammer on each other and tried to smash one another as badly as they could. Instead, they had something more thoughtful, more precise, more measured. But, and that also, I think, highlights uh, another problem, not just the fact that maybe if you have two guys of lesser technique, they'll engage in some rock and sock and robots with nothing to lose, but also the fact that the UFC bonuses are kind of decided in a, I won't say haphazard fashion, but it's not always the same way because essentially it's an informal panel of UFC President Dana White, matchmakers Joe Silva and Sean Shelby, uh, UFC big boss Lorenzo Fertitta, and maybe some others. So they kind of just wrap on who they think is most appropriate, who they think should get it, and they come to just a kind of a general consensus and, and give them out. Well, sometimes a particular one of those guys won't be at an event or maybe there's something really great on the undercard and Dana White's sequestered in the back and hasn't seen the fight. So ultimately, sometimes these bonuses, uh, they might come down to one person's whim, like Dana White deciding Tom Watson, Stanislav Nedkov was an awesome fight and going crazy for it and giving them lots of money. Or it could be him not being at an event and Joe Silva and Sean Shelby independently deciding, hey, we kind of like that, we'll give it to the guy in the undercard. So um, I think the hard thing that's, the thing that's hard about statistically quantifying the fight of the night bonuses is that the actual methodology in deciding them, never mind the abstract nature of what makes a great fight or right. the fight of the night, it's not really the same judicial process every time when it comes to actually allotting the money. And, and that says nothing of the fact that there's discretionary bonuses that we don't even hear yeah, exactly. about. You know, the guy who goes out and gets plastered in a valiant fight and they slip him five, six figures extra, you know, to the black book in the back and it's never reported. Yep. That's the big difference. We're taken care of. Yeah. That's a big difference. Taking financially, you're talking about. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, if you go out there and you put on a show and you do your job as a fighter, they're going to take care of you. That's just the way it is. Do your job. It's, it's, it's a confounding factor for us because there's not perfect knowledge about compensation. So we get uh, requests from academics, people who want to do research on the economic incentives. Um, how do these things affect performance? And the answer is we don't know because we don't really know how much people are getting paid. There's how much that gets reported publicly, but we really have no clue for what the overall picture of compensation is. So it's very difficult to take a look at uh, economic incentives when you don't know what the incentives really are. Uh, I can't, I can't fault the UFC for the way that they do their business. It's just from a data perspective, it's just opaque. And so it limits what we're able to do with our data. So, so we're, I'm t let's just back up. I mean, where, where is this data being? I mean, you're, you're generating data that I think we all agree is, is groundbreaking and brings, uh, far from the fact that it's, it's interesting and tells a story, I think it brings a level of credibility that we all like. But where, I mean, if the fighters aren't really relying on this, they're not using data for fight of the night, and I mean, you hear a, a bit during the broadcast. I mean, wh where is this? data being used right now? Primarily, it's being used in two places. One is on the broadcast, so you'll hear it referenced by the broadcasters, and it's used to help illustrate a point or to help uh, talk about a fighter and give you some, some number to, to chew on so you can hang your hat on saying, like, 
It's not just that this guy, previously we might have said this guy is a great wrestler, but now we can hang our hat and say, well, his takedown accuracy is 65% when the UFC average is only about 42%, so that's actually really good. And the second place that you'll see it is online, where people are able to use these numbers to help foster conversations. They use them in the service of usually both sides of the same argument, which is kind of funny, but that's the way the statistics run. So people will take the numbers after the fight's over and they'll say, just to give a recent example, Leto Machida, Dan Henderson, hmm. Leto Machida landed more significant strikes than Dan Henderson. Well, yeah, but Dan Henderson landed more total strikes than Leoto Machida. Uh, Dan Henderson was chasing Leoto Machida, yeah, but Leoto Machida was avoiding most of his strikes. Well, you can use the numbers to help uh, support both sides of an argument, but that's where the numbers are being used, and it's just a matter of time before the numbers gain the value either through more advanced metrics, greater exposure, some different things that we can do, as Jordan mentioned, something like motion tracking, where we're able to provide the value in the numbers so that they can be used more broadly in the case of fighters in camps, we already have some fighters in camps who utilize the numbers to help them train, not necessarily to game plan opponents because the small sample size being right. what it is, but you're able to take a look at these macro effects that we talk about, understand what's important generally, how you should be focused on what your fight, your, your skill set, and things like that. What else? I mean, we, you'd mentioned this in passing, but I'm sort of curious what, I don't want to know what to call them, so sort of what collateral gems, what inadvertent gems you stole. You, you mentioned, t tell a story about low blows, for instance. Low blows. Wait, yeah. your data, this is all what, what sort of collateral uh, gems in the data. What? Right, we can, we can take a look at a lot of different things, and sometimes it's not the question that everyone wants to know, but it's the question that when you give them the answer, like, oh, that's interesting. We took a look at uh, what the effect is on fighters after they've received a low blow. What happens in a fight is if a guy gets kicked inadvertently low, then they'll give him time to recover, and when he says, I'm okay, then the fight continues. But the question in everyone's mind is, isn't he irreparably damaged from this thing that happened accidentally to the point where He's never the same. So we took a look at the data and we said, what happens when a guy gets kicked low? Does he lose the fight more often than he, than he would have otherwise? And the answer is no, 50-50. The guy who gets kicked low and the guy who does the kicking win the fight in equal proportion, regardless of how much time, as long as the guy takes a certain amount of time to recover, if he takes averages about 22 seconds or so uh, to recover from the low blow, once he's had that chance to recover, he stands just as good a chance of winning that fight afterward as he did before. Now, if he was getting beaten up beforehand, chances are he's still going to lose, and that extra time to recover is not helping him. But if he has the, uh, the even advantage or he's winning, the fact that he got that low blow is not something which is going to turn the fight on its head. Now all of a sudden, he's going to lose where he would have won otherwise. And that's just one little nugget that the data shows that we're able to take a look at because we have this vast data source at our disposal. See, if you had motion track on me, you would have seen me dart off. Um, all right, I guess we're, this is going fast. I guess we're running low on time. Let's, let's just take some questions. I'll, if you guys, if you guys want to raise your hand, we can do that too. I've got some here, but let me let me take a few off here. So, uh, all right, here we go. Toss up. What are some of the barriers for greater adoption of advanced stats in the media organization? Let, let's talk about ju and judging. Let's let's talk about let's let's bring up judging because, you know, I always name me another sports league in which the de facto commissioner routinely criticizes. The, you don't see David Stern saying. Uh, you know, the Lakers and Celtics played hard, but God, the three officials on the floor were awful tonight. Well, you, and you the thing about the NBA is you kind of assume that, you know, maybe, you know, Joey Crawford does a Spurs game and he's a big meanie pants and <laughs> kicks Tim Duncan out. But over time, you assume that some good refs Love are going to ref all of these, right. all ref all these teams, and it's going to be like a regression to the mean. Whereas in MMA, I mean, ultimately, like Rami said, the stats winning and losing, and there's such, I mean, you might fight only once a year. So... From that like particular perspective, I think it becomes even more important to force that kind of accountability because the fact of the matter is we don't have enough time to just, oh, well, you know, you're going to, like people always use the example and they, well, if they fought 10 times, dude, they're never going to fight 10 times. You're right. never going to fight someone 10 times. You'll be lucky to get to a trilogy if you're a pay-per-view star and people really like you. So it's, we're never going to get to a point where there's a regression to the mean and, oh, well, yeah, eventually, you know, enough competent judges judge their fights that they got it right. So the quicker we can kind of get people on board with um, their minds kind of becoming more attuned to stuff like fight metric, the better we can kind of address uh, some of the judging issues. Because the fact of the matter is, I mean, going back to that Dan Henderson, Leonardo Machida fight, um, you know, not to besmirch anybody but the man I'm about to bring up, but I don't think it shocked anybody and, and probably made Dan Henderson backers feel quite bad when, you know, this controversial fight, everyone thinks one guy won the other, and it turns out that the guy who had the fight for Dan Henderson was Cecil Peoples, who was a notoriously not great judge, you know. So 
when you're in that kind of situation, I think the, the quicker that we can kind of get to a point that all of these stats are accepted and people kind of are on the same page with what constitutes significant or effective or worthwhile, uh, the better we can be. Also, just a point of order. Sure. Um, you mentioned that no other commissioner sort of blasts their own judges routinely. It's not totally correct. I mean, he's not really a commissioner, neither is a commissioner. But if we accept Oscar De La Hoya as the head of Golden Boy, and we accept Bob Arum as the head of top right. rank, they also do, which is sort of instructive because they're regulated and judged by virtually the identical people, particularly in Nevada, yeah. California, and New Jersey. It's the exact, almost right. the exact same referees and almost the exact same judges. We should probably give New Jersey a pass, though. New Jersey's a pass. Nick, Nick Lembo, the, the counsel for the New but, Jersey you know. Athletic Control Board, insists on having MMA people as right. opposed to boxing people, but for the wide variety, especially in Nevada and California, you're Fair. dealing with the same group. Fair enough. Uh, but Nevada, the home, the fight capital of the world, yeah. You know, uh, Dana White tweeted, I think, yesterday, as a matter of fact, that they were out of their mind for a different reason. They fined Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. $900,000 but for marijuana. But uh, long story short, it's a disastrous enterprise. There you go. So uh, here's, here's one for Dom. I mean, wh what would you like to see? I mean, what, what sort of, whether it's advanced statistics or more data, I mean, what, what next, next few years as your career continues, what, what would you like to see data collected on? I'd like, <clears throat> um, what would I like to see data collected on? I mean, I think they're already taking data on everything. <laughs> I mean, they are. They have data. You guys have data on everything, and it's the truth. Um, I, what I'd like to see is just more accuracy, which comes with time. Um, I'm not saying that fight metrics and judging isn't necessarily accurate, but what I'm saying is it can always get more accurate. Now, the way I look at it as a fighter, I mean, what do I know? But I'll say that fight metrics and judging are one and the same, in my opinion, because I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but do fight metrics give those, those reads to the judging? They no. don't see it. How does it work? No, they, they just They off, watch off. the fight and judge it. Then, there you go. Then yeah. that's two different things. Yeah, I didn't know, know that. So now, how does that make sense that we've got the numbers and we're not going to show the judges the numbers and all the judges know is boxing? They don't, know, they don't know. It's terrifying. They don't too. know wrestling. They yeah. don't know jujitsu. They don't know anything other than boxing, what a slip is, a bob and a weave, and they might not know that according to Golden Boy and all them from what I'm hearing. <laughs> so it's possible. my thing is, as a fighter, now you gotta say don't leave it to the judges because now you're thinking, well, I got these judges that aren't even looking at the numbers that we're taking statistics on until the judge has been made, the judgment's been made. It's like going to a judge and saying, what do you think, judge? And, uh, you don't look real good, so I'm gonna call you guilty. Well, I mean, Check the law books after, see if you, it's all right. Yeah, why don't you check out the, the case a little bit before we make a judgment? And it's hard because that's the evolution of the sport and that's growing in the sport. And I don't know, I, I'm not in control of that and it's not my job to hate or anything, it's my job to adjust. And I think that's where fighters need to make the adjustment is if you know this is the case, then make the adjustment. I mean, I'm not proud of it, but all my fights have gone the distance and I've figured out a way to win most every round, every single fight. I did that for a reason. I mean, I'm trying to finish the fight from round one to round five. And it just depends on how you're fighting. If you know that that's how the judging is going to be, it's your responsibility as a fighter to make the adjustments to the judging. It's not otherwise. Well, I mean, let's, let's, let's go speed round. I'm going to. If I could just make yeah, one, yeah, sure. one quick, quick point about the, the way that the data is collected on site. We have two different data collection methodologies. We actually have four. But for the, these purposes, what we collect live on site in the venue is purely unofficial. And the reason why is because human beings are not capable of seeing and reacting fast enough to what's showing up on the screen to take an accurate measurement. It's just not possible. So we use those numbers for uh, illustrative purposes. You can show them on screen. You can get a, a general sense for them. But we throw them away. And we have another data collection which happens in slow motion. Because the only way that, like I said, human beings are incapable, so we'll turn you superhuman. And we'll give you the ability to advance frame by frame if necessary. When there's uh, a 10 strike combination between the two guys that happens under two seconds, there's just no shot that you're ever gonna get that an accurate count. So we don't trust it. And we go back and we advance frame by frame when we need to, but that is slower. And it means necessarily that the judges won't get a chance to, or they'll never get a chance to see those numbers unless you're willing to wait potentially 15 minutes after the fight is over for an official count to come that, in. I mean, it's, it's funny, because this question dovetails nicely with that. Sure. Uh, last year you spoke, you said live stats were too hard. Are you making progress with data to involve fans live? I mean, sorry, it's 15 minutes is about the, uh, I mean, the question, the question is basically, are you making progress with data to involve fans live? Data to involve fans live. Well, we do have the data that is collected live, and you can access it in a couple of different places. The UFC has a UFC.tv uh, mobile application. 
uh, tablets and phones where you can download it and you see live statistics. Um, Xbox just launched their smart class application for pay-per-views where you can see a bunch of numbers that come in. So there are ways that you can interact with these numbers live, but the challenge is, is that uh, I don't have perfect confidence in those live numbers. So if you're willing to wait a little bit of time for the official numbers to come in, and if the question is how long does that take, right. it's variable based on the action and the fight. If there's a fight with Dominic Cruz, for example, uh, I, I'm telling Jordan on the show that I actually gave the score who did your fight against Demetrius a fight night bonus <laughs> because it took him about an hour and a half to get that 25 minutes done. You guys just Gosh. don't stop moving. If you could slow down, I wouldn't have to use slow motion. No, that's a wreck. I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> no worries. I was trying to get him to slow down, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Goodness. So if, if, if that's the case, and it could really take an hour and a half, 90 minutes, to get a 25-minute fight done, then there's a limit on what you're going to be able to do in a live environment. So if I can ask people's indulgence and their patience, then we'll be able to do a lot of things with the data. Fantasy sports is something that we're passionate about and we're involved in. The UFC just launched two fantasy games in the last month, and there's some other ones that are out there right now and on the horizon that do take statistics into account. Well, let me, let me ask you. I mean, if you, uh, 90 minutes is pushing it, but you're, you're not the pay-per-view guy, you're not the promoter. I realize there are other considerations, but as a fighter, are you willing to wait 15 minutes after your fight for a decision that's going to be less objective and more um, based on data? I don't, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind waiting, but it's, I, this is news to me. Um, to, to hear no, that. Right, to, I mean, are you, you willing to as wait. a fighter, would you be willing to wait that time? In the, more like, I, it depends on how, I mean, that's a whole different <laughs> protocol. Like, am I sitting in the cage for 15 minutes after I get done with a war? Like, no, I'm out of there. Like, get me out of here. Do I have to wait in the back and then they'll come with the decision 20 minutes later while another fight's going on? This guy won. I don't know. Do you bring us back out in the middle after you decide? I don't know. Thing is, I, <clears throat> this is this is news to me that that, that you got to go back and do slow motion to get the fight metrics numbers. Right. You can't, yeah, you can't possibly give that to the judges. So now, we literally just have judges who know boxing rating and MMA fight with everything. And, and that's the okay. thing that's chilling is if you're being honest. I mean, if you seriously like look at the fight metric numbers after decisions and follow MMA, I, I think anyone would be out of their mind to say that the fight metric numbers are not a greater predictor of who actually won a fight or greater representation of what actually happened than most judges. But obviously, there's a huge logistical yeah, issue exactly. with like, you're not going to like, all right, sweet, 25 minute main event UFC title fight, let's hang out for 15 minutes while they do the bean counting. <laughs> it's just never going to happen in spite of the fact that realistically, robo judge from fight metric would be an infinitely better <laughs> judge than most people. Well, the, the reason why I think people tend to take the numbers that we have, and as Jordan put it, they think that they're a better representation of who won the fight, is because we're not using the judges' criteria. The judges are forced into a box, and they have the unified rules of mixed martial arts as their guide. That's it. They can't deviate. Now, you can quibble about their interpretation of those rules, but they are tasked with judging a fight using a set of rules. We're not. So we're able to watch the fight the way fans watch the fight. And our numbers are based off of uh, assessments and algorithms which take into account who's doing the things which historically have uh, won fights in the past. It's not looking at things like aggression or octagon control, which are these kind of nebulous qualitative characteristics which a judge can apply however they see fit because there's no right and wrong answer. <coughs> the rules are not written that specifically. But if we take a look at who's landing the strikes, who's landing takedowns, who's doing submission attempts, we're able to look at things the way that fans do. They're seeing who's actually the one who's affecting the most action. And that's why I think people look at the numbers and say, yeah, well, that actually kind of jives with the way I saw the fight myself. And the judges may not even be wrong. The judges may be right, given what they have to work with. Uh, generally, the judges do a good job. It's, it's, there's a couple of outlier examples which you're able to point at and say, like, man, that was awful. Uh, but for the most part, when we've taken a look at the numbers, the judges give the fight to the guy who the numbers might have said would win, win it otherwise. Where we get down into the round level, it gets a little bit more complicated because sometimes judges will give a round to a guy who might have lost. But by and large, the winner of the fight, by, from the judge's perspective, is the statistically superior guy as well. Would, uh, let, me, let me ask you this. What, what do we know? This is an interesting question. C sensors and gloves? Does that come up at all? You what was the question? Be willing sensors and gloves? Sensors, sensors and, gloves. and gloves. For what? There's, there's some challenges to it. There's some that's, it, that's so incomplete, there's though, there's because the there's game, some technology. I mean, some guys don't punch. They wrestle. They yeah. grapple. Uh, they right. kick from distance. With Ed, a guy named last night, Ed West, probably threw about a thousand kicks, knocked a guy out. Maybe two jabs, three jabs. I mean, you can get data. You can get. I mean, I don't want to. He knows more about motion da uh, data tracking and the evolution in mixed martial arts. But um, the sensors and the ch if you could put a sensor in someone's glove, that would be beneficial. But it would be um, vastly incomplete in terms of understanding a fighter's repertoire and, and effectiveness. It's more useful in boxing. Yeah. Right. Right. The, yeah. Let me go to the audience for some.
something, I think you used the phrase, to bite into, you know, in terms of being able to understand the sport, appreciate the sport, get insight into the sport. Is that really kind of where the, is that, I guess the question is for Rami, is that really kind of the point that you, the sweet spot that you want to hit? Yeah, the, the, the efforts on the part of the UFC to include live data, where historically, you know, we were, we've been working with the UFC since about 2008, 2009. And we've been giving them official data. The official data is the one that gets uh, done using the slow motion tracking. Starting at uh, UFC 143 in February of last year is the first time that they publicly displayed the live data which is collected on site. And they decided to do that because it does give fans a different take on the fight or it gives them something to bite into. And that's growing uh, using social media and some of these online platforms where you get better access to it. On screen, obviously, during the fight, they can only show a limited amount. On your phone or on your iPad, you can see a whole lot more. So you're going to start seeing over the course of the next few months more and more of these applications which are able to take this data and make use of it so that fans can look at it. Now, it's true that it's going to change because once we get the slow motion data back, we're going to, we're going to have to you know, rewrite history a little bit. Um, the numbers that come through live are not perfectly reliable. But if you were just looking at it from, you know, well, that's kind of interesting. I didn't realize he outlanded him two to one. That number's probably going to hold up. Let me just say, as a website editor who is obsessive about a different kind of metrics, being traffic metrics, we're kind of hand-wringing over a non-issue here just a little bit. The fight metric data might come out for a main event. So the next main event will be St. Pierre versus um, Nick Diaz. It will come out however long after the main event. Once that comes out, the traffic on a website on a Sunday is almost tantamount to that on a Saturday night. I mean, there is this enormous amount of group talk and discussion and, and debate fervently so on a Sunday. So, you mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know what's promotionally tenable to have Dominic Cruz wait 15 minutes to get the real data. That probably seems to stretch, but this idea that we can't have that debate and that engagement over the actual numbers is false. I see them on Sunday. They are enormous. So, um, we already kind of have that mutual experience. Right. Are there, yeah, I'll just say, let's go. Sure. We'll, we got, we got, they're sounding, our, our corner is uh, yelling at us to put the pressure on, so we got to go quick here. But. Uh, so, how are, how are MMA When you say randomness, do you mean that you know, people win fights, fights after a losing? Strike, was that uh -huh. a significant strike from skill, or was that a significant strike because the opponent moved the wrong way, you know, stuff like that? Like, how are we analyzing that? Uh, you know, like, a significant strike from making a, uh, a big push. How are, you know, how are we analyzing that it was actually, um, so when the fighter looks back, then he can see that, yeah, I had a significant strike, but was that something that, you know, was, was that luck, was it randomness, you know, was that actually skill on my part, was it a mistake on his part? There's a certain amount of qualitative analysis that has to be done on an individual fight level. Uh, I, I think that if you're going to take a look at what the numbers said in a particular fight and try to draw very broad conclusions from the numbers, you're missing something because only the fighter and his opponent really know what happened inside of that cage. So you can take a look at the numbers and you're able to evaluate performance. We look at things based on outcomes and you either landed that strike or you didn't. Now you can know in your heart that, man, I, was, I wasn't even trying to land a strike. I was, I was looking at something out in you know, the stands and I just kind of waved at them and all of a sudden I hit him in the face. Now that's an accidental strike, but if you hit him in the face, we count it. Uh, it's, it's purely outcome based. So is there gonna be luck or randomness in the data? Yeah, that's true. If you have an oopsie daisy swing in baseball and you kind of bloop the ball over the uh, second baseman's head in the center field, it counts as a hit on your stat sheet just the same as everything else does. We just have a lot more repetitions in baseball. We can drown that out and find where your skill lies as opposed to you know, what might have been a lucky punch. What I thought you were referring to is when fights turn on a dime, when you have a guy who's winning, Chael Sonnen's beating Anderson Silva for 23 minutes and 10 seconds, and then Anderson Silva throws up a triangle choke and negates four and a half rounds of complete dominance from Chael Sonnen. How do you account for that in the data? How do you, there's no sense in a baseball game where a team that's down 10 runs does one thing and now the game's over. MMA is different in that regard, but luckily for us, we found that those fights are extremely few and far between. We think about them a lot because they're dramatic and they, they stick in our memory. But for the most part, the guy who's winning the fight for two and a half rounds, he wins the fight after three yeah. rounds, too. I mean, you also have stats of Chael Sonnen doing that several times. So if you read the fight metrics, you'll know <laughs> he gets submitted at the end of almost yeah. every <laughs> I think the other thing that's compelling, too, is I think it's a good reason, not just for motion data, but also one thing that intrigues me is the idea of looking at strikes and techniques in combination to one mm -hmm. another. Because we can't, we, can't, we can't say, well, Jose Aldo landed a lot of leg kicks. 
he's a great leg kicker, but what makes Jose Aldo so special in the leg kicking department is, you know, he, he throws the high jab to make guys think about it and move, or he, he steps in and throws the left to the body to force guys to move back and then kicks them in the leg, which hurts infinitely more because the guy's moving backwards and then gets crushed straight in the knee. We see this also in fighters like Melvin Manouf and others, or, you know, how does certain fighters strike while going backwards and these kinds of things. Um, when guys are able to chain techniques together, I mean, that's, that's the sign of a high-level fighter. You're able to do things in concert with one another and chain them together to achieve a desired result. And that's one thing we see in elite-level fighters, whether, you know, it's Anderson Silva purposely moving backwards with his hands down to set up like an anchor punch, or George St. Pierre stepping a certain way to get the angle he wants to rip on a knee pick, or whatever the case might be. Or I guess you too, you got a pretty good knee tap as well. Um, all these kinds of things, they're not, they don't happen individually. It's not like, well, I'm doing a technique, then he's doing a technique. The ability to set up techniques and sort of look at, well, what were the two or three things that actually led to this technique, and probably actually led to it being more effective than another technique of its kind, seems equally as important as whether or not the leg kick landed. It's true. Our, our in game terms, if you're a video game player, right now the statistics look a lot like a turn-based strategy game when they're actually more comparable to a real-time strategy game. And that's another level of analysis where you expect that over time, when people get more used to the numbers, they're able to evaluate them in more sophisticated ways. You'll be able to see sequence analysis, taking a look at, you know, what was the thing that you did right before the thing that mattered? Uh, what were you doing? How were you moving? All of that is an evolution that will only continue from here on out. Let's remember, too, that what might seem lucky to the, to the fan or the general public has no luck involved as a fighter. When you look at, like I just said, Chael Sonnen, he's one of the best fighters on this planet. He's, un he's awesome. But you look at towards the end of the fights, he almost fights himself into a lull. And then there's the submission towards the end of the fight if you game plan it correct. I, s I swear, I mean, you look at Anderson Silva, he'll tell you there's no luck involved. I mean, you look at past fights at Chael Sonnen, you have to make that, that read that he, you might be able to catch him in a submission towards the end of the fight. He's done it several times. He'll beat the crap out of guys the whole fight and then almost essentially kind of lull himself to sleep in their guard until he gets into a, falls into a submission. Guarantee you Anderson Silva had that in his brain, said, man, I've lost 23 minutes of this fight. This hurts so bad, but I know he's going to fall asleep. I just got to stay on my game, and I just got to wait. And he landed that submission. That's my belief. I don't think it had to do with luck. I think Anderson saw that read. And he thought about it and knew he was in for a dogfight the whole fight until the end. And that was his chance, was towards the end of the fight to get the finish, and he did it. All right, one more submission. Uh, this question was for Dominic. Um, do you think there's going to be a point where you are as a fighter's live analyst to your training camp the way you have a trainer or nutritionist for the rest of the role? Do I think that I'm going to what? At one point in, in your training camp or for other fighters that you would add a dedicated analyst to help you prepare for an upcoming fight? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Uh, I wouldn't. Um, I'm an analyst, so I'll break it down myself, <laughs> one. But if I could, would I have one? No, because as a fighter, uh, kind of like what he was saying earlier, you kind of let your managers or your training partners watch the video for you. It is very easy to kind of flood. You're in a fight situation, especially in that eight-week camp, you're so emotionally invested into that fight that it's hard to, to sit and watch a guy over and over and over on tape without getting, like, going crazy, essentially, really. And uh, there's just so many reads that you want, and you're trying to, you're trying to, when you watch too much video, you try to make a fight go a certain way, when the truth is, you can't do that. So, as an analyst, in your ear telling you this is what's gonna happen, this is how it's gonna, you're better off with on-hand, on-job experience, in my opinion, in your corner, necessarily, than a numbers guy, in my, that's opinion-based. We went the distance. Just like one of your fights. We'll go to the judges. No, th guys, thanks everyone, and thanks for your time.